Ethics and Audience, a guide to speech making. Ethics is what a person uses to determine good from bad, right from wrong, in both thought and actions. Ethics is what you do when you're alone. It's not just what you do in public or in front of everyone or anybody you're with, but it's also what you do when you're alone. For example, your thoughts or your judgment. Now let's have a short review on ethics in public speaking. So there are two principles of ethics. The first one, all parties in the communication process have ethical responsibilities. The second one, ethical speakers and listeners possess attitudes and standards that pervade their character and guide their actions before, during, and after their speaking and listening. Let's start with the first one. All parties in the communication process have ethical responsibilities. I'll show you a scenario. A speaker is inappropriate or acts unprofessionally, and the audience then reacts unprofessionally as well. So when we talk about all parties, we are talking about two parties specifically, the speakers and the audience or the listeners. So when a speaker acts inappropriately, the audience would probably act inappropriately as well, or there would be a negative reaction to it. And in both scenarios, it's not really good and it's not really ethical. Now let's go back to the second one. Ethical speakers and listeners possess attitudes and standards that pervade their character and guide their actions. What does pervade mean? Pervade means affect. So there are some attitudes that affect our character, thus also affecting our speaking and listening skills. Take, for example, two people who are raised differently and are from different backgrounds, beliefs, culture. Now, they have different points of view. And because they have different characters, this will affect the communication between the two of them. Their listening and their speaking skills because they have different points of view and sometimes these views may be opposing. When we talk about ethics in communication, you need to be able to learn how to exercise ethical speaking and how to exercise ethical listening. Ethical speaking is consciousness with words used, whereas ethical listening is consciousness with words heard. There are six guidelines for ethical speaking. Speak up about topics you consider important. Choose topics that promote positive ethical values. Speak to benefit your listeners. Use truthful supporting material and valid reasoning for credibility. Consider the consequences of your words and actions. And lastly, strive to improve your public speaking. According to Bernard M. Baruch, U.S. President Advisor, most of the successful people I've known are the ones who do more listening than talking. This quote is very important because there are so many people who tend to just give and give, which means they give information and talk, but they are not really open to listening. So let's talk about ethical listening and how we can exercise that. There are four guidelines for ethical listening. The first one is that you have to seek exposure to well-informed speakers. Now, how do you do that? Do your research, of course. Research on speakers that are well-known for their credibility and listen to them. They can give you proper information, credible sources, 
and of course they can help you in your growth secondly avoid prejudging speakers and their ideas we as an audience or even you know we as individuals have a tendency to judge a person by their appearance have a tendency to judge a person by how they speak or how they appear in front of everybody and by doing so we are already unconsciously prejudging these speakers before being open to their ideas the third one is that we have to evaluate the speaker's logic and credibility now we just don't need to just adjust how we look at people and how we judge people but we also need to be open to the thoughts that the person gives the logic and the facts and the credibility that they show us despite the fact that we have opposing views and lastly we have to beware of the consequences of not listening carefully i cannot stress enough how important this is as i've said before listening is really a skill if we know how to listen properly and carefully we can avoid misunderstanding aside from ethical speaking and ethical listening there is also such a thing as being ethical when it comes to composing or writing your own work. Now let's talk about the fair use guidelines, specifically on plagiarism. So there is such a thing as fair use provision. What is fair use provision? This answers the question, when is it okay to use the work of others? Based on the book, that we have for our lessons this is what it says it discusses the fair use of copyrighted work including such use by reproduction in copies or phono records or by any other means for purposes such as criticism comment news reporting teaching scholarship or research is not an infringement of copyright these are the only times where it is okay to use the work of others for criticism, for commenting on something. When you are reporting on news, when you are teaching, you can use the work of others as references for scholarship purposes, for research. These are ways where you cannot be or you can have a pass when it comes to using the work of others. But of course, you have to also take note to avoid plagiarism. What is plagiarism? Plagiarism is a literary, artistic, or musical theft. And even if the speech is performed orally, it is still subjected to copyright protection. Thus, it can be considered as plagiarism to perform a speech or a part of a speech that does not originally belong to you. So this very example here is a good depiction of plagiarism a person getting another person's idea so let's delve into that more as a student how do you know what are examples of plagiarism i'll give you a very common scenario now let's analyze the scenario here on the left side on the colored area we have an author who wrote his thoughts on the internet and uploaded his work there as research reference. So that's a person composing his own work. On the right side, we have a student who copied his work from the internet and used it as his answer. So this student took the author's work and claimed it as its own or as his own. Why is this considered as plagiarism? It's considered as plagiarism because that work that the student claimed as his own answer is not really his. He took it from the internet. He copied it from the source and pasted it on his work and claimed it as his own. Another issue there is that when people think that they got one paragraph and think it's okay, because they added their own words after that, it's not. 
it's still considered as plagiarism. Even a single sentence composed by another person and copied and claimed as your own is still considered as plagiarism. So take note of that. How do you avoid plagiarism? So how do we avoid plagiarism? Of course, there's always the question there. It's such a gray area. There are so many students who ask, how do we know if we are just using that as a reference, we are using that as an example, and how do we know if it is plagiarism or not? So here are some pointers. To avoid plagiarism, you need to take clear and consistent notes while researching. How do you do that? You take a pen and a paper and write down the details, additional information that you got from the research, and your own understanding. By doing so, it can help you with your paraphrasing and it can help you make your own work from the research that you've made. Second, record complete source citations. This is very helpful when it comes to writing your own research, your speech, or any other essay. When you put your complete source citations, it can help your readers get that reference as well, and it will honor the creators, the original writers, and the original people who composed that said work. Number three, clearly indicate in your speech any words, ideas, examples, or organizational structures that are not your own. So when you are having a speech or performing a speech, in front of the audience, you can indicate it in your paragraph or in your speech if you are quoting a person. So according to said person's name, or if you will be using a diagram that is not your own, you can state this diagram was made by, and then you can state the name of the company or a person who made that said diagram. Use your words, language, style, and thought structure when paraphrasing. Now, when you paraphrase something, you get the idea of that certain information that you got and change it into your own style. And write it down so that it will sound like it is your own, that it is solely for you and it belongs to you. And lastly, when in doubt, cite the source. You can state that in your speech and there's no need to be conscious about it. You can say, according to my research, or according to this article, or from this magazine, etc., etc., you can do that. That's avoiding plagiarism altogether. And in that way, you can get yourself out of trouble and compose an original and authentic work. Of course, once you're done understanding plagiarism, let's talk about civility in the classroom. What is civility? Civility is communication behaviors that reflect respect for others and foster harmonious and productive relationships. As a student, it is your role to be able to speak with civility and listen with civility. So how do you do this? So how do you speak with civility? When you speak with civility, you need to have good motives, prepare and assess what you will say, respect your listeners, speak with conviction, encourage the other side to be heard, and welcome feedback. So if you have that positive attitude already in front of your listeners, Again, as I've said, the listeners are like mirrors. They will reflect you as a speaker. So you have to make sure to give what you are ready to receive. Of course, listeners have their own roles. So how do you listen with civility? You give speakers your full attention. You expect to learn something. You evaluate the merits of the speaker's ideas and supporting materials, and you provide the speaker with constructive feedback. Now, constructive feedback can 
if you are a large audience, it could just be a typical smile, a nod, an applause. If you are a small group, you can give your criticism as well, but make sure to actually filter your words and speak with respect. Now, as a speaker, we need to take note on how to analyze our audience. This is the most important part because without our audience, we will not become public speakers. So how do we analyze our audience? Audience analysis has two definitions. The first one is that it is the process of gathering and analyzing information about the audience. The second one is that this is the most critical aspect in speech preparation. Let's double back to the first one. The process of gathering and analyzing information about the audience. This would mean their attributes and their motivations. Now, why is this the most critical aspect in speech preparation? It is very important because its aim is to prepare a speech in a way that is meaningful to the audience. To be able to achieve audience analysis, it is important for you to adapt to audience psychology. This is how to appeal to your audience. How do you, as a speaker, reach out to your audience for your audience to be more interested in the topic that you are giving them? When preparing your speech, take note of the audience's opinion on the topic of your speech, you as a speaker, and the occasion of the speech. The topic of your speech answers the question, how would they feel about the topic you will talk about? How do they feel about you if you're going to be asking about you as a speaker? And of course, how do they feel about the occasion? Let's start with the first one. Gauge the listener's feelings towards the topic of your speech. So here are some guide questions. What do the listeners know about the topic? Is the topic new to the listeners? If the topic is new, you need to be able to express its relevance to the audience or connect the topic to familiar issues that they may have experienced. And the last question, they hold a positive or a negative thought on the topic. So these are the first guide questions that you need to take note of. Now let's talk about gauging your listeners' feelings if they know little about the topic. So what do you do? You give them the basic and then you add background information. So give them the knowledge that they already know and then give them supplementary or additional information. Secondly, avoid jargon or technical terms, especially if you are talking to an audience who is not connected to what you specialize or to a topic they're not familiar with. Try to avoid terms that they will not understand. Instead, keep it simple and easy to understand. And of course, repeat or summarize important facts. You have to make sure to get your point across by repeating this over and over. Don't sound like a broken record, but you can add that in your speech and for them to actually remember once you are done making that speech. Now there's another thing. If the listeners have a negative reaction to the topic, what do you do? So there are five things that you can do if your listeners have a negative reaction to the topic. First one, establish rapport and credibility. As a speaker, as I've said before, it's very important for them, for the audience, to know that you are credible, for them to believe the information that you're giving them is in fact factual or true. Secondly, avoid challenging them. Instead, approach them with similarities. Find a common ground for them to soften up to you, for them to be able to slowly be comfortable with the topic even if they are opposing or even if they are part of the opposition. Third, 
find out why they are against the topic. If you have time, if you can do your research prior to that, you need to find out why these group of people or these individuals are against the topic that you are presenting. If you do not have enough time to do your research prior to that, try to enclose that in your speech by asking questions and communicating with your audience. Why do you not like the topic? Why do you feel uncomfortable with it? So by doing so, you would know how to be able to make approaches. Fourth one, provide solid evidences. You can have cases, you can give examples, you can have different articles to prove your point. Now you are not there to convince them otherwise, but you are there to make them be open to other oppositions, even if they have a different take or view towards it. And lastly, offer reasons for them to be open to the subject. If the audience has a positive attitude towards the topic, you can add more emphasis towards the arguments and points that they agree with. And of course, you can add stories. It could either be personal or otherwise. It could be based on a person that you know or an article that you've read. And these stories would add color to the speech. You can play this to your advantage, especially once you find out that the audience is in your favor. But if the listeners are a captive audience, you need to stress why the speech is important to them. And of course, you need to focus on brevity and driving straight to the point. There is no use to lengthening your speech when you know that your audience is just there out of requirement or they did not attend that event or occasion on their own free will. Audience members like to feel that the speaker recognizes them as unique individuals. You can do this by making positive references to the place where you are speaking and the group to whom you are addressing your comments. Personalize the speech by applying relevant facts and statistics in your speech directly to the audience. For example, if you're talking to students in a university, you can talk about their statistics. Isn't this a university with a 100% passing rate? Or if you're talking to a group from a certain location, you can mention tourism spots, you can mention dishes, you can mention a person that this location is known for. Now this will not only make them feel that they're special, but this will also be to your advantage because they will feel that you like them enough to actually do your own research about the certain location and about them as the audience. Now let's go back to the second one. When preparing your speech, you need to take note of their opinion on you as the speaker. So you need to gauge your listeners' feelings towards you. What is the audience's perception of you? How do they feel about you? Do they have or do you have the same background as them? And are you personally connected with each other? So how do you get a positive audience attitude? One, credibility. Focus on showing your audience that you are credible. This is the ethos, your credibility. How do you do that? Use facts, use figures, use reference, and do your research. Second, identification. Make sure you have things in common. Find similarities, give experiences, share stories, and find that common ground between you and the audience. And you can just see that by how they react to when you are talking. Third, use eye contact and body movements to make the audience feel like they are included. Make sure that your gestures are open to them, making you appear approachable, and make sure to keep eye contact with them. Fourth, Share an important story or experience. Not only will this make you relatable, but this can also help you connect to the audience in a personal level 
for them to actually see you as someone that's really related to them, someone that's relatable. And lastly, appearance. It is important because you need to be able to get that positive reaction from your students. So you need to be able to dress and look appropriate for the occasion. You do not wear your pajamas on a wedding speech or during a wedding speech, right? So again, dress for the occasion. Now, you need to be able to read and analyze your audience. How do you do that? When you are speaking in front of people, you need to take note of one, large smiles and eye contact. This means that they like and agree with you and they are showing interest. Folded arms or when, you're, when their arms are folded. This may possibly be disagreement or when they are disagreeing with the point that you gave. It could be a frown, it could be a reaction, different negative reactions. Third, averted glances, slumped posture, and squirming. When we talk about squirming, it's when a person is moving around and you know, showing and acting very restless in their seats. This shows disengagement, meaning they're not interested in the speech, they're not interested in what you're talking about, and they just don't want to be there. So how do you solve this? First, communicate with one or two listeners by asking them to share a personal experience, their view on the topic, or an idea. So this can help or this can be to your advantage, especially if this, the, the audience would like you. They would be more open to sharing their experience there. If they disagree with you and you approach them properly, they might be open to sharing their opinions with you, why they disagree on that certain matter. If they are disengaged, they would wake up from that uncomfortable feeling and that detachment to, you know, being back in the present and joining in in that conversation in your speech. Or again, we go back to the secret formula or the secret, secret weapon for speakers, which is when you share a story connected to the topic to add more common ground. Now let's talk about the last part, the occasion of the speech. How do they feel about the occasion? The occasion. So these are your guide questions. Did they go there voluntarily or were they required to attend? Is the topic related to them and to the occasion? Here's something that you have to remember. There is a difference between captive audience and voluntary audience. Captive audience means people who are required to listen to the speaker and attend the event without any choice. Sounds familiar? Yes, we've all been there. We've all had that certain occasion or event where we are forced to attend. Voluntary audience. People who attend the event of your own free will. When you really want to join that event, you really want to be there. So there's that difference between the captive audience and the voluntary audience. And lastly, be authentic. You should be able to avoid pandering. What does pandering mean? Pandering is the process of focusing so much on catering to the audience that the speaker loses credibility. So there should be a balance. As much as you want to reach out to your audience, do not let go of who you are. Do not let go of your purpose as a speaker. So be that person and expect that audience to like you. And here's the technique. Treat the audience like you do with a new acquaintance. You need to get to know them and establish common ground. And once you have that proper balance and good formula to be able to do and make your speech, you would be a successful individual and you can go out there and be that great public speaker that you are destined to become. So this is the end of our discussion. We'll talk more on our activities and of course, our finals. Good luck and God bless us all.